take our Bible. Isn't it wonderful that we can have a Bible? We don't have to hide it. We can carry it with it, carry it with us openly, not have to worry about uh, being turned in, recorded, uh, persecuted. Your Bible precious to you like that is God's word. Philippians chapter four is a great chapter. And when I think of uh, Philippians four, I think of this theme. Two things in this chapter that really I want to key in on. As far as I'm concerned, this chapter is about peace and prosperity. And as I look at it, those are the two things that every human heart really longs for. A life of peace and prosperity. We want to to be able to not have to worry about personal or or bad relationships and uh, We don't want to worry about how we're going to make it through difficult circumstances. I'm talking about spiritual peace and spiritual prosperity in Philippians 4. And to have those, it requires certain attitudes and actions that only God can give us. This chapter, just like the rest of the book of Philippians, is about living for God. It's about the Christ life. And to enjoy both spiritual peace and prosperity, it requires what Paul says in that first verse of chapter 4, where he says, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Stand fast in the Lord, being loyal or faithful to God. In order for that to happen, I was thinking about that this morning. I said, Lord, is there anything here in chapter four that I haven't put in my study that you want me to bring out? And uh, this thought came to my mind, and I know it's from the Lord. In order to be loyal and faithful to him, there are two things in our lives that we have to deal with. And here they are. In chapter three, And verse 13, Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to to have apprehended. I haven't arrived spiritually. I'm not uh, entirely sanctified. But he says, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. One of the first things you have to deal with, you're going to live a life that's faithful to the Lord is you have to deal with past bitterness, forgetting those things which are behind. But also, in the fourth chapter where we are this morning, in verse 6, Paul says, be careful or anxious or worried about nothing, but in everything by prayer. The second thing, in order to be faithful to the Lord, Not only must we deal with past bitterness, forgetting those things which are behind, but also we must deal with present and future anxiety and worry. In fact, worry and anxiety, just like bitterness, is a big sin in the Bible, in God's eyes. It's something that God does not uh, want to tolerate in his people. And I would say this, that you cannot worship the Lord, which is what we're gathered here to do together this morning, and be worried, as well as bitter. In fact, if you don't deal with bitterness and worry and anxiety in your life, if you don't deal with it now, you're going to it's going to be dealt with before the judgment seat of Christ. Because he's going to bring everything to light that hasn't been dealt with. And the judgment seat of Christ for a believer is losing reward instead of gaining reward. And reward is in the context of spiritual crowns. And in Revelation chapter 4, you know what the church does? You know what believers do? All the crowns that they have been rewarded with, they cast at the feet of the Lord. 
And if you have not dealt with uh, bitterness, worry, and anxiety in your life, and it is brought to light at the judgment seat, you will not have a crown to cast at the Savior's feet. You'll be empty-handed, which reminds me of an old gospel song. Must I go and empty-handed, thus my Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet. Must I go and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? Not at death I shrink or falter, for my Savior saves me now. But to meet him empty-handed, thought of that now clouds my brow. Must I go and empty hand? You don't want to be empty-handed when the time comes to worship the Lord by casting a crown at his feet, saying, Lord, I'm not worthy, but you are. And here is how I show my worth, uh, your worth and my worship to you. You don't want to be empty-handed. So deal with bitterness now. Deal with anxiety and worries now so that they won't have to be uncovered when he shines that light upon our hearts at the judgment seat. Anyway, that's yours at no extra cost. What I want to really talk about is this spiritual peace and prosperity that the, the, the fourth chapter is all about. How do we have this kind of peace that is mentioned in that sixth verse? Well, we know uh, that it says that we have to pray. And then God gives this kind of peace. But there's more to it than that. And I want to share it with you, but I think we ought to pause a moment and, and pray before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we're here this morning because we've come to hear from you. And we want you to speak to our hearts, if you haven't already, Lord. I pray that you would. And what you've already said to us, I pray that we would say, oh, Lord, you're right. Oh, God, I need to straighten these things out between myself and you. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts where it's needed, comfort our hearts where that is needed. Lord, we pray that if there be anyone that doesn't know you as Savior, that they would not be deceived into thinking they are if they're not. And Lord, if they're not, that they would come to recognize that there's only one way, and that is by realizing they are guilty sinners before a holy God and that Jesus is their only hope, and they receive him and what he has done in their place as their sin-bearing substitute on that cross, and that they might receive him as personal Savior and know forgiveness and become the recipient at that moment of eternal life. Jesus himself. Father, we pray for an anointing of both your messenger and the listener, that you might accomplish the purpose for which we're gathered here today. You might receive the glory of our worship as we prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of God, which is something that every believer in their heart of hearts really longs for. And there are some, there's three key elements in the first five verses that I want to share with you that I believe are what are required in order to know this peace. And really what it comes down to, and don't you see this theme over and over and over again in the book of Philippians? It comes down to selfless living, selfless living. Look at how he begins in the first verse. He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, greatly loved, and longed for my joy and my crown. Again, he calls them my dearly loved ones, my dearly beloved. That's the first aspect of selfless living. It's right here in that first verse. And it really comes down to a oneness that we share. We share a oneness in Jesus. And that oneness creates in us a deep love for each other and a valuing of one another. And that translates 
into look at what verse two and three talk about, where he beseeches these two ladies to be of the same mind. Obviously, they are they're suffering disagreements. If we deeply love one another, and if we really value one another, we'll do what Paul calls them to do regarding these two women. We will be peacemakers. We will translate that love and that value of others into peacemaking, and we will help others humbly to settle their disagreements. The greatest things that any church can experience is a oneness. And you know, the Holy Spirit of God creates that oneness. But it's up to us to maintain that oneness. In Ephesians 4.1, we are called upon to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. It is something the Spirit of God creates, but we can lose it if we don't seek, if we don't endeavor to keep it. So oneness is really a major aspect of selfless living, which is an ingredient of knowing this spiritual peace. Look at verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, even when the ceiling collapses on you. And again, I say rejoice. Another aspect, a second aspect of selfless living is not only having a oneness in the brethren, but also a joyfulness in the congregation a joyfulness. Notice it's rejoice in the Lord. It's to delight in him. And it is the way that we respond to circumstances that threaten to rob us of our joy. Remember, Paul was a prisoner, and he had been beaten, and he was in that uh, excruciating pain in stocks in that dungeon in Philippi. And At midnight, he and Silas are singing praises. They're rejoicing in the Lord. It's not that we rejoice because our circumstances are so wonderful, but we're rejoicing in the Lord. We're delighting in his presence with us. Regardless of our circumstances, God's here. God's with us. And he is able to strengthen us to be able to endure and overcome and even uh, go through whatever it is victorious. And so we are rejoicing in that joyfulness. A third aspect of selfless living is not only oneness and joyfulness, but if you look down at verse 5, he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. That word moderation, some translations say your sweet reasonableness or your gentleness or kindness. Joyfulness is the way that we respond to circumstances, but gentleness or moderation, as it is in our English translation here, is the way that we respond to others, not harshly but with sweet reasonableness, with gentleness, with kindness. Why? Well, he gives a reason in the next verse, in that uh, next sentence, because the Lord is at hand, (laughs) because God's at hand, because Jesus is coming soon. Do you think about that? Not just that Jesus is coming, but here he says he's at hand. He's coming soon. Paul believed that. Over and over when you read Paul's letters, he believed that Jesus was going to come back in his lifetime. And I think we need to believe that too. He said the Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming soon, and so we need to be prepared for his appearing so that when he appears, we're not ashamed. We're not caught off guard and uh, and ashamed at his appearing. You can't love his appearing if you never think about it. You can't love his appearing. There's a special reward or crown for that, for loving his appearing. You can't love his appearing if uh, you're not prepared for it, if he catches you off guard. Jesus is coming. He's coming again, and he's coming soon. Now, that's prophetic truth, but listen to me. Prophecy is not just to satisfy our curiosity. 
but it's meant to impact our lives and our love for Jesus. He's coming soon. So this peace that we're talking about involves, first of all, selfless living. But now let's skip down uh, to the next couple of verses, and I want you to see that it involves secure living. Selfless living, secure living. Drop down to verse uh, 6 and 7. The, the, these are, are going to be our memory verses. This is uh, uh, secure living. You know how to have security? The most insecure people are people that are focused on themselves. They, they're focused on their appearance. They're focused on what other people think about them. Very insecure people. The most secure people are people that are focused on the Lord. And this is what he's talking about. Secure living is to be concerned more with the Lord than you are with yourself. And it is it, it, it uh, involves an inward peace. Look at it here. Be careful for nothing, he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Secure living involves an inward peace that he's talking about in these verses. A, a, a real prayer life, if you really pray, you're trusting God. If you're not trusting God, then your prayers aren't real. They're not genuine. We're told by Peter to cast all our cares on him. How do you do that? Well, you do it through prayer. It's a prayer life in which you cast your burdens, all of your anxieties, all of your cares on God. That's real prayer, and that's what he's saying here. Real prayer trusts God, and when you pray like that, when you really trust God, it will eliminate your anxieties. Anxieties are not only sinful, if we allow them to remain in us, they are distracting us, and they are completely destroying that inward peace that God wants us to have all the time. We are to pray, notice he says, with thanksgiving. I challenge you to find anything about prayer in the Bible that doesn't include thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a vital ingredient in every prayer life. All true prayer involves a thankful attitude. We don't thank God for the disaster. We don't thank God for the, uh, for the bad things, but we thank God for his purposes through everything. We thank God that uh, he can work despite whatever the circumstance is. That's what we're thankful for. We're thankful that no matter how bad the circumstances are, God's unchanged, and he's in charge, and he's in control, and he is with us, and he can enable us, and he can help us to go through it. So that's what it means to pray with thanksgiving. Prayer, notice he says here in that sixth verse, in everything by prayer. And that word prayer is, uh, uh, has the connotation of worshiping God, the way that uh, a worshipful approach to God. You know, as I said earlier, it's impossible to worry and to worship. Can't do it. Because worry will negate worship, and worship will eliminate worry. And then he says you should pray with supplication, let your requests, supplication and requests uh, have to do with requests for specific needs, things that you specifically ask God for. You know what prayer does? It doesn't put the ceiling back together. It doesn't uh, dry the wet floor. It doesn't change circumstances. Prayer changes you. Prayer changes you and gives you inward peace. Gives you an inward, incomprehensible, supernatural, fruit of the Spirit, an inner tranquility that he says in verse 7, will keep, literally will guard, will stand guard duty 
on your heart, which I believe is your affections, which includes emotions, and your mind, which of course is your thinking. God's peace will stand guard duty over your affections and your thinking through this method, and you'll have inward peace. You know, the prophet Isaiah said, he said, uh, um, he said that he would give us perfect peace if we would trust in him. Perfect peace. Wow. I mean, I'd settle just for peace. <laughs> perfect peace. That is complete peace. Total peace. That's God's promise. Have you ever claimed it? Lord, right now, I don't, I, I need perfect peace, and you promise to give it. Or Jesus, the legacy that he left his people before he ascended to heaven, he said, my peace give I unto you. It's a peace that's totally opposite and different from what the world calls peace. It's not just a cessation of war. My peace give I, it's an inward, supernatural peace incomprehensible fruit of the Spirit, a tranquility that guards the heart in inner peace, secure living, secure living. This peace is selfless and secure living that involves an inward peace, but also it involves, look at verses 8 and 9, an upward focus. Are you with me? I hope you're awake this morning. I see some heavy eyes. Stand up, do some jumping jacks. Stand under the, the drips. Let that wake you up. Verses 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, and yet he's not at the end of his thank you note yet. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there be any virtue, praise, think on these things. That's an upward focus. Secure living is, it, you know, what secure living, how it begins? By not letting your mind or your thoughts run wild. By having your thought life under the Holy Spirit's control. By bringing every thought into captivity of Christ. By renewing your mind on a regular basis through the Word of God. By having your mind if you be risen with Christ, focused on things above, where Christ sits on the throne, and not on things on this earth, that's what he says. Things that are true, all of these characteristics, honest and just, pure, lovely, all of those things really are about the Lord and his word. You'll find all of that in the Bible. You'll find all of those characteristics in the Lord himself. So set your mind on him and the things of God and have that upward focus, things that are true. Someone said that 92% of the things that we worry about never happen. And the 8% that does happen, we have absolutely no control over anyway. Things that are true things that are honest and just, things that are worthy of respect and are right, things that are pure, that is morally pure. Think on things that are lovely, things that are beautiful and attractive. Think on things that are good, things that are worth talking about, things that are virtuous, things that motivate you to want better things that are praiseworthy, things that you can commend to others, the upward focus, okay? So that's the first thing that every human being wants is peace, and spiritual peace involves selfless living and secure living. The second thing that the human heart longs for is prosperity, and often when we think of that term, we think of money, financial prosperity, but that's not the kind of prosperity Paul's talking about, although he talks about money in, in this section, 
the prosperity that Paul talks about is not necessarily financial. It can be not necessarily financial, but it is a guarantee spiritual prosperity. Guaranteed. Ironclad. How? How can we have this guaranteed spiritual prosperity in our lives? Well, look at what he says. He, he's talking about what I call sustained living in verse 10 to 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. You know, the word sustainability is a big buzzword in today's society. And if something is sustainable, it means it has the ability to uh, be permanently maintained. And in, in all of this, uh, this uh, uh, climate talk, they, the big word is sustainability. Well, I want to talk about some spiritual sustainability. I want to talk about sustained living, the ability to be permanently maintain a position of spiritual prosperity, which involves two things. It involves contentment. Sustained living involves contentment. Verse 11, Paul says, I don't speak in respect of want. I don't have any needs financially, materially. Why? Because I've learned. Learned what? In whatever state I am, therewith to be content. By the way, verse 10, he's not complaining that they hadn't uh, met his needs. He's just saying, look, I realize that uh, you haven't had an opportunity of late. His joy is not dependent on favorable circumstances because he's content. See the word content in that 11th verse? It's an interesting word. It's the only time this word appears in the entire New Testament. And what it means is self-sustained or self-sufficient. In Paul's day, there were different groups of philosophers. There was one group of philosophers called the Stoics. And the Stoics were, they were self-reliant. Uh, they relied on fortitude and uh, they, their whole mantra was to just calmly accept life's pressures, you know, with a stiff upper lip. We just grin and bear it. That's stoicism. <clears throat> Paul says, we are content. We are self-sustained, not like the Stoics. This is not self-reliance like they exercised, but he says it's something that we learn. See that? In verse 11, contentment is something that is learned. And again, here's another word in this passage that is in the original language is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. I have learned. It literally means to be initiated, like a, a, an initiation into a secret mystery religion. I have learned. I've been initiated. He's content, Paul says. His sustained living, which is uh, seen in his contentment, is because he has learned by experience, he has learned by experience to rely on Christ's sufficiency within him. When he says I'm self-sufficient, he means it's Christ that gives me my sufficiency. And that is the key to contentment is to rely upon the sufficiency of Christ. He is everything that you need and more. He is totally adequate for whatever circumstance you face, for whatever problem you have, good or bad. He is the one that gives us sustained living. And that's what he means in that 13th verse when he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's not a self-help verse. That verse is simply saying, the way that I maintain 
my contentment, the way I live a sustained life is because I have enablement for my contentment. I am enabled by Christ in me to be content in every circumstance. He is strengthening me. He is constantly infusing his power in me and through me, enabling me to be content no matter what happens. This is a prison letter he's writing. He's under house arrest. He's chained uh, uh, 24 hours every day to a Roman guard. And yet he says, it's okay. It's all right. Because the Christ within me gives me the power to be content in the worst of circumstances or the best of circumstances. See what he says, verse 12? I know how to be a base. That's the bottom of the barrel. I mean, a soaking wet rug and uh, ceiling tiles on the floor. I know how to be a base, but I know how to come into a room where there's brand new carpet and it's beautiful. I can handle either or. I can be content either or. I'm instructed both to be full and hungry, to abound, to suffer need. I can do all things because I'm enabled. Contentment because of enablement. That sustained living. In the last uh, part of this chapter, he talks about prosperity from a different standpoint. Not only is prosperity sustained living, but it's sacrificial living. See what he says in verse 14? He says, notwithstanding, talking to the, the church there in Philippi, you've done well. You did communicate with my affliction. The word communicate means you've shared money, <laughs> you've shared goods, you've met my needs. When I needed it, you did good. You helped me. Verse 15, now Philippians know also in the beginning of the gospel, when I first went to Macedonia, remember in chapter 16 of Acts, he got that Macedonian vision and come over in the Macedonia and help us. He said, when I first went there, no church helped me financially. No one communicated with me. He didn't mean sent me letters, but sent me money. No one supported me except you. You only. Verse 16, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. In other words, the church in, at Philippi was very tuned in to Paul's financial needs, and they sent him love gifts. They sent, they made him their missionary project for that month, and they would send him a love gift uh, several times, he says, you did that. And he said, I bring this up, verse 17, not because I desire another gift from you, not because I'm out of money and I need another love gift. You know, it bothers me, honestly, when missionaries keep letting me know their needs all the time. Paul, he's saying, you know, you did good by giving to me, but I don't need your gifts to survive. God will take care of me is what he's saying. And then he says, not because I desire a gift, verse 17, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, here is the, what he's saying. He, he is content, and yet he's thankful. And he's thankful because he knows what sacrificial living is, and he's teaching them, and they're learning it. So concerning giving, he said, verse 18, I have all and abound. I am full. I don't need any more money from you because I received the, the things that you sent with your, uh, your messenger, Epaphroditus. Thank you. That was, notice, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing. Your giving was sacrificial living. You gave sacrifice. You have invested in my ministry. Giving to, minist uh, giving to missionaries and ministry really pays eternal dividends, is what he's saying. Fruit that may abound to your account. God pays back those who, for no other reason than they're moved by the Holy Spirit and they love the Lord and the Lord's work that they support. Uh, that missionary or that ministry. 
And it, he says it's a sacrifice. In verse 18, it's like that Levitical offering that uh, that pleases the Lord. It's the same when he uses that uh, phraseology, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. It's the same phraseology that he uses in Ephesians 5, 2, to talk about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That's significant. Sacrificial living. It involves giving. But here is the other part. Sacrificial living not only involves giving, that, that, that sounds logical, but sacrificial living also involves receiving. Look at what he says in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God is going to reciprocate this church. It's like Paul saying, you met one of my needs? Well, God's going to meet all of your needs, and he's not only going to bless you out of his bounty, but he's going to bless you in accordance with his bounty. You know, the book of Philippians is, of course, about the Christ life. That is, Jesus living in you, Jesus living his life through you. And I don't think that there's any better gauge than giving to God's work. If you're living the Christ life, one of the best gauges is how you give to God's work. If you're stingy in giving to God's work, you're selfish. If your giving is a rigid percentage, you're legalistic, self-righteous. If your giving is grudgingly and under pressure, then you're giving through self-effort. In the latter half of the 17th century, a German preacher by the name of August Frank founded an orphanage to care for the homeless city kids. And one day when he desperately needed some funds for the orphanage to carry on his work, a destitute Christian widow came to his door begging for some money. And because of his financial situation, he, he regretfully told her he couldn't help her. Well, the disheartened woman began to cry, and he was moved by her tears, and he said, okay, you wait here. I'm going to go to my room, and I'm going to pray. And after seeking God's guidance, he felt that the Holy Spirit wanted him to change his mind. So trusting God to meet his own needs, he gave her money. And two mornings later, he received a letter of thanks from the widow, and she explained how that uh, because of his generosity, she asked the Lord to shower the orphanage with gifts. And so that same day, Frank received 12 gold coins from a wealthy lady and then more from a friend in Sweden. He thought that he had been amply rewarded for helping this poor widow, but soon he was informed that the orphanage was to receive 500 gold pieces from the estate of Prince Ludwig van Wurttemberg. And when he heard this, he began to cry in gratitude, in sacrificially providing for that needy widow. He had been enriched and not impoverished. If you want your heart to be with God, then you have to invest and spend yourself in all that God leads you, that you possess to invest and spend in the Lord's work. Very important gauge. Jesus himself said in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. And Paul commended the believers in Macedonia in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. They, they were not wealthy. He said they gave out of their poverty. But the way that they were able to do that is they first gave of themselves to the Lord and then all that God asked them to give. Recently, I read the testimony of a pastor who went to university for training. He finished his training. He then went to grad school uh, and graduated from seminary. And he took a, a pastorate and God blessed his ministry and the church really began to grow. But as he preached and worked in the church, he began to sense an emptiness in his heart. And so he came to his study 
He locked the door. He turned off the light and he laid down on his face on the floor. And he told God, if this is all there is, I don't know if it's worth it or not. Isn't there something you can do for me so that I can have the power to live the Christian life with some kind of effectiveness and joyfulness and meaning? At that point, he said it was as if I were a briefcase. And God picked him up and turned him upside down and began to to shake him. And as he shook him, he was appalled at what began to fall out of his heart. Impurity, pride, arrogance, unbelief, all the evidence of carnality within him began to fall out. And God shook him until he wondered if there would be anything left when he was done. And then he says, it was as if God stopped shaking and he turned me right side up again. And then he poured himself into me and he filled me completely with himself. And that fiery Holy presence permeated every corner of my being. He said it was as if that dark room was lit with the light of the glory of God. And he said a few weeks later, I was in a a staff meeting with uh, men in the church. And uh, after we were done at the end of the meeting, someone said that they all noticed that something had happened to their pastor and they wanted to know what it was. So he told them what happened. And they said they liked the change. (laughs) Well, I'm telling you, we all need that kind of change. And that kind of change only happens when you as an individual have a personal encounter with God himself. He's the only one that can bring that kind of change to your life. And that will begin a life of real peace and prosperity.